Welcome back to Trending in Education. Dan Strafford, Michael Palmer, Brandon Jones along with you. And on this week's episode, we're going to talk about a recent article from BuzzFeed News. And Helen Peterson authored How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. Continue our discussion around generations, Gen Z, millennials, the workforce, uh, but specifically tackling a bit here around millennials. Uh, but always want to ask, Mike, how are you doing? Uh, as a Gen Xer, yes, sir. I'm happy to be included. So thank you for remembering me. We're still here. I haven't got anywhere. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm enjoying life. I'm curious about this topic because uh, I want to understand better how hard it is to be a millennial. So, uh, so let, let's, let's, let's figure that out. Brandon, I maybe sent some sarcasm in Mike's voice there, but how are you doing? Um, <laughs> is it only millennials that can be burned out? I mean, that's, I feel like that's my, that's my question. I feel like um, that's a bold move to uh, own the moniker of the burned out generation as if you're trying to box other people out from those feelings. So, right, right. I mean, I don't know that I'm feeling uh, that that sounds like you could put two in that comment together and get that I'm feeling burned out. I'm not really like, I'm fine. Are you speaking as a millennial right now? Well, see, here's the thing. PU the PU Research Center. Pew, yes. Is that how it's pronounced? Pew, pew, uh, pew, pew. Yeah. Um, they tricked me. They said it was 1977, but I like everywhere that I see it, it's really like 1980. It's more like 80, I think. Yeah. yeah so Dan, who's, who's fist pumping or maybe doing a dance from Fortnite, the millennial, um, is I think in the, in squarely in range. But um, I feel like I've been rejected by the millennial generation for trying to like shoehorn myself in there after that PU research center uh, report. <laughs> and, um, you know, as a result, I feel abandoned by Gen X. Yeah. Uh, it's I'm the Xennials, right? That, yes. That's what that's, that's in that space you're, between Gen X and Cuspy. Cuspy. But um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm interested in, in this stuff. I, I will tell you my, my bias just going in is I am skeptical of anyone who intends to speak for a generation, no matter how much data she provides. Yes. And I've, I've had some conversations I can come back to later in, in, this, in this pod about with some millennials of late who were taking issue with other millennials about how those people were categorizing all instead of some. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm primed to be resistant to this topic. Nice. Which is something she addresses uh, in, in this article, in this column uh, on BuzzFeed News and, and addresses the fact that many millennials do balk at other millennials trying to box them into a specific type. And we've all heard uh, different uh, stereotypes or variations on them about uh, the millennial generation. But Mike, it is an intriguing discussion point from the discussions we've had with Tarlin around millennials and Gen Z, the workforce. Um, I will say, and you know, whether a cusper or, or a millennial or not, I do identify with some of the things she discusses herein. Um, I do think there are relevant topics, but I do agree that it, the generalizations are too much. There, there's too much to, to ascribe to just this age group uh, to be completely accurate. But from your you know, reading of this article, some of the other ones we shared, what were your, your general takeaways or, or you know, even diving deeper, what were some of the takeaways you had that you thought were uh, relevant to our, our audience and to learning and to the idea of education? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a few things. First off, if you're talking about millennials and uh, generations, um, you got you to gotta call back to Strauss Howe. Uh, who, Strauss Howe, brown cow. Strauss Howe, who came up with the original framework uh, in which we're talking about all of this. Uh, so look up Strauss Howe, uh, spend a little bit of time ramping up on that just to understand where this comes from and how much science versus uh, pseudoscience is involved in generational thinking. Um, there is a lot of it that's about marketing uh, and there's a lot of it that's about identity and how much folks have allowed uh, marketers or demographers to, uh, to peg them and to accept the label, uh, which is why I do think Gen X is interesting in that, uh, not to overgeneralize, which is the other big problem that I have with generational thinking, but I think Gen X just generally uh, has, even since the 90s, when they were uh, telling us we were Gen X, we were like, whatever, man, you don't understand me. And, uh, and now to the point that Gen X is frequently omitted from the conversation, there was a, a you know, a shared on social uh, where Gen X was uh, omitted from the living generations. <laughs> like there was, there was a conspicuous omission of Gen X. But, uh, but it is interesting how much millennials, even though I think there may be a little bit of uh, denial of the fact that they are a generation, 
have actually internalized and identified as millennials and as different, uh, which I think is natural around the, 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 the emerging generations. But I think what's why millennials in particular may be uh, facing a bit of an identity crisis is that they're, they're approaching an age where the generation behind them is also emerging. So yep. like where they, they had uh, kind of the entirety of the collective attention uh, really up until the last uh, four or five years where Gen Z has become the, um, the, the prevailing emerging generation that people are talking about. Now millennials are saying, oh my, what's up with that, man? Like we're supposed to be special. Uh, now we're no longer the, the center point or the focal point of the conversation, although they are in this article. Uh, I think they're, that's one challenge. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was the level to which millennials are perfectionists and how they're very much tied to their visual identity in a way that um, uh, clearly those Gen Xers like myself are not as tied to our visual <laughs> identity. Uh, and we're clearly not perfectionists, come to think of it. But, um, but it is interesting, though, while they are generalizations, I think those trends are, are likely real. And then if we're talking about um, educating the, the, the emerging generations, uh, as I understand it, Gen Z is the biggest generation we've seen in in really a century how are we going to think about uh, right. how gen x and the millennial generation relate and then also as again i got to drop the recent parent thing but uh but matthew my son yeah what generation is he he's gen next oh gen next yeah just, when did that start you I know just, i just coined that just right. now oh did you right. oh nice I, I don't know i gotta look i up. fell for it you, i just uh, in I, such a believable I, way about I, you. i've heard them uh called generation alpha uh, but I don't like that. I prefer, if you're going to call them Generation Alpha, call them Gen Next, but that might just because I'm Gen X and it sounds a little bit like that. But, uh, but I think that we're, the name there is still gelling. Uh, even just like millennials uh, were briefly called the Homeland Generation, mm. which is like a terrible name. That's the worst. Like I, I, I think, um, and I, we, we could riff about names for generations. I think we actually, we have a show in the back catalog about generational names. It's the Strauss Howe yeah. uh, episode. But yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think um, a couple of the quick takes on this, the, uh, the concept of generations being a period as long as they traditionally have been, I think that's got to fall out of fashion. Ooh, I like um, that. Yeah. So, you know, this is millennials talking about ages 22 to 38. And I think with the rate of change in the world, things are, it's not like, you know, growing up in the eighties, that growing up in the early 2000s was the same as growing up in the later 2000s. I mean, like I think the world pre 9-11, I think pre 2008, um, you know, economic crash, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Mm -hmm. Those are very different than the periods that followed it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get that there are moments in time that happen in the middle of generations and you don't just demarcate things around specific incidents like that. But um, I, I think from knowing a bunch and working with a bunch of people who are in this age range, one, everybody's different. So stop saying you're all the same. And two, there is a difference between people who are 25 and people who are 35. Right. Um, and one of those things, I think the thing that I found most compelling about this article is, uh, for people who graduated in 2008 from college or 2009, um, there were many fewer jobs in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that can put you on a path where, you don't uh, enter the workforce so that your um, your lifelong earnings are not impacted by that one year at forty five thousand dollars. They're impacted by that one year at the end of your career at the highest income that you would have been making, mm -hmm. or and that one year may not be one year, maybe three to five years. You don't move out of your home so that you're um, living with parents to stay to save money when for those who can, and that impacts you know a social trajectory as well. There's 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 real impact for people who are in that moment. Mm -hmm. But I think those people versus people who are graduated five years later, even right. is very different. Right, and right, so right. Um, uh, I think that there's, it's a pretty talking about populations, it's all very heterogeneous in terms of its makeup, but across this generation, particularly. Yeah. Yeah. I like where you're going too. Cause like it, it, rem it reminds me of uh, enlightenment, the book enlightenment now by Steven Pinker, where he talked about uh, I've talked about this before the different, like there's age cohort and period effects. So like there's how old am I? When was I born? What was hap what's happening in the period I'm living in right now? And then what's happening to my entire cohort? And all three of those things interrelate in yep. terms of how I uh, engage with the world. I do think also the angle on lifelong earning, uh, when I'm ready to talk about lifelong learning, yeah, uh, is interesting too, because I feel like your earning potential 
uh, and your ability to find a good job very fundamentally impacts how you think about learning. So like, you know, if it's relatively easy to get a good wage, uh, then you might be more apt to pursue broader learning interests that may round you out differently than if you're, you're graduating from high school or college during an economic crisis, in which case you might say, I need to get more formal education, I need more skill development to make me relevant in the workforce. Um, I think those period effects are, are really fundamental, like, like what's happening in the world around you. Um, and those actually, they hit us all, you know, like it, that's the other thing that I think frequently can be limiting uh, when you think about generations, even the, you know, uh, Tarlin and I have gone toe to toe a couple times on, uh, you know, uh, digital natives as a concept. Cause like, if you're still not digital now and you're Gen X or whatever generation, you know, baby boomer, and you're still not digital, that's a problem, you know, like, and, and to think that only those who grow up around the digital and around the technology are uh, empowered to activate it and to be, uh, you know, benefit from digital technology. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that's dangerous for the older generations. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, I think for uh, millennials and younger, for them to accept the external label or to say, oh yeah, we are burnt out because I'm a, I'm a millennial and uh, almost reject the growth mindset around sort of the negative aspects of your generational framing. I think that's problematic too. So like, don't accept that you are a perfectionist if it's better not to be. And like, how do we get, I think the challenge is millennials may not have had the opportunity to kind of break those fundamental frames because it was very much accepted that you're gonna have access to everything. Everything's enabled through an app. And like a lot of the sort of conventional wisdom around why millennials are the way they are. Yep. Um, I, I think there's probably new interventions and new like social emotional uh, curricula to be developed to sort of counteract some of the negative components of the millennial mindset. Yep. But I don't think it's limited to millennials too. I think like a lot of us in the modern age are suffering from some of the same problems that are probably most acute for, yep. uh, for millennials. Mm -hmm. I, I think a ton of what you said, I agree with. And I think that um, the digital point is a great one that th new things come along all the time. And if you're not adjusting to them and accepting them, just because you were born into the time that they existed, you can learn and you can grow and growth mindset. We've talked about many times over uh, being born uh, before computers were regularly used. I started using one when I was 12 or 13. And I used you know, one for the rest of my life just because I wasn't born into it already existing. I learned it. What I find interesting here is the discussion around by the author, uh, the financial ramifications of the events Brandon talked about. And I do think that that is more generational and can be sort of boxed into a time period. Whereas the idea of the perfection and the idea of needing uh, to feel that way is tough for me to gauge because that's about nature versus nurture, how your parents raised you. There is a sense of the, this parenting generation, those who parented millennials, taught them more to try to be exceptional, that they were going to have opportunity to be exceptional. And I do think that's a real thing, but I don't think it happened everywhere. And I do think we get lost in sort of these overgeneralizations there. But to getting back to the financial stuff, as we talk through it, Brandon, as we try to figure out what the counterpoint is, well, like how do we uh, change this culture or is there a change this culture? Are we working too much as millennials? Are we taking on too many things to try to make up the, the financial burden they have, college debt, whatever it might be? Is there a counter force to it? Is there a, a change of mindset or something that you see, something we can learn or, or change uh, to, to better that, that process? Uh, it's a big question. I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer it all that well. So I'm going to try to take a couple parts of it. Um, I think that thinking, being thoughtful around um, what kind of learning and then earning path you're on is something that we need to think about. So we've talked about, you know, there's a bubble that has not burst in higher education around the cost of a two year, four year, especially degree. Um, I think the whole like go to college, sunny, um, or was there a girl version of that? Like go to, go, go to college, uh, son or daughter. Daughter. Um, uh, and everything will be fine when you get out of it. Well, maybe, um, but you, if depending on your means, you likely are going to, especially if you're not below a level, uh, uh, below which the college will pay for you, the college mm -hmm. university will give you a, a full ride. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, if you're stuck in that sort of middle, like which most people are, that's the middle, um, mm -hmm. the, the financial repercussions of that are going to be uh, long lasting. Mm -hmm. And so I think really doing some introspection, reflection on what kind of work you want to do, like, is it likely that this is actually, this degree is actually going to move you ahead and make you a better candidate in that space. And that's hard when you're 17 years old, like know what you want to do when you grow up. So I don't want to just glibly say, why aren't people doing that? But there are alternatives. So whether it's, you know, like a coding boot camp or something that, you know, a series of micro credentials and whether employers start to look at those as uh, replacing of the typical two or four year degree, which they, it sounds like they start, they are, we've touched on that in past podcasts. Mm -hmm. That's a, a bit of a counter movement. Um, I, I would just add one other thing, which is a little bit farther away from that topic, but this, this felt, this felt very American centric. Also this point of view Oh, sure. that I, I wonder what the, you know, this generation in Asia or, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or Europe. And I, I think it's probably very different there. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that in, in Europe, in, in like Italy and Greece and a couple of places that we're reading about that, where the economic impacts were even more pronounced. There's something, I think I've referred to this before in the pod, but something like 35% of, uh, of men in a certain age range, and it's a small range, like five-year range, it's not a full generation, but in Italy and Greece are like forever unemployable because they spent a certain number of years unemployed post the recession. Mm -hmm. And now, like after having been out of work for, it's now 10 years, but before five, six, seven years, you basically could never get um, into a job. And so like there, and with a social welfare program there where you can be sort of unemployed until you retire from unemployment, mm -hmm. you're creating a whole generate or a whole micro generation of, you know, agitators and people who right. instead of going to work are sitting around and like, you know, uh, being less positively contributing to society potentially. So anyway, I, I just, I, I, uh, meandered a little bit off of your initial question, Dan, but, um, I think it's interesting to think about what, what sort of counter trends or counter uh, effects there may be, and also how broad these effects really are, how myopic is our, is our viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued as a parent and as a millennial of what I will teach my kids based off of what I've learned, what I've gone through, and that's sort of, I think, how we learn what's next uh, for the next generation, Gen, Gen Next, as, as Mike uh, dubbed it. Uh, what do we pass on, Gen Xers and millennials who are now parents and, and teaching the next generation? There is another article here, Mike, and I wanted to touch on it briefly about that we're not only, maybe there is burnout, maybe this article is uh, accurate, uh, but we're also watching this sort of specific take on television. So we're sort of getting art imitating life or life imitating art, whichever way you want to look at it. And uh, we talked about tidying up last show. We talked about a, a robot butler. And one of the major hits on Netflix right now is Marie Kondo, uh, the, the uh, tidy up specialist who comes into is homes. Is she a robot? And, Wait, sorry. Are you, no, sorry. It's <laughs> not the implication I'm making. Um, uh, but basically talking about if you haven't used an item in a specific amount of time, you throw it away, you thank, you for, thank it for its service. There are very specific things that she goes through. Um, but in some of these episodes, you're seeing millennial center stage uh, discussing themselves and talking about perfection and how their outward um, persona, what they look like and what things they have in their home matter so much to them. Do you feel that's a art imitating life or do you think that's an accurate portrayal as per the article we talked about from BuzzFeed News and what we are seeing in media and art currently? Do you have a take there on, on what, what's happening in the media we're consuming? Yeah, I think the problem is real. The problem of clutter and overconsumption is real. And um, pegging it as a millennial problem, I think maybe more marketing, uh, sure. understanding like that audience is who people want to see. Uh, and then also even calling someone a millennial uh, is almost like, you know, when we were talking about to uh, Ken Florence, who ha has synesthesia, he, we don't call him a synesthetic or a synesthete, you know, so like your generation is part of who you are. It, it's not, it's not as definitional as I think we're defining it. Uh, and I think if we could sort of break that frame and also maybe make more surprising choices around who, who is getting helped uh, around the problem. Uh, Cause to me, the problems that cut across generations are more profound and interesting than the ones that are specific to a generation. And I think in terms of tidying, um, that's not, specific to uh, to millennials. The thing that I thought was interesting in the article, the Atlantic article you're describing, Dan, is that uh, the visual identity 
and the idea that my visual identity will be compared to others so that I need to portray myself in a way that is perfect so that I will pass muster when compared against others. Uh, that might be a little more tied to generational movements and the advent of social media, social me the yep. advent of Instagram. I think for sure. And like, that to me is a real problem. And like, we haven't gotten into that because it's a little bit of a, it's a weightier topic, but even like, you know, suicide rates are up and uh, just like the way in which uh, young identities are being formed while like the visual comparison to others is so front and center. That's a really profound thing. And beyond cluttering, there's more like, I think, pro meaningful work that people are going to have to do to kind of get healthy. Um, and I think that's true across generations, but probably most focused on the younger generations who've grown up with a very different set of social contexts. Dan Stratford, Mike Palmer here. We wanted to give a little bit more time to the end of that episode, a pickup of sorts to continue the conversation. Ran a little bit short on time as Mike brought up a really important point there, Mike, uh, about uh, social media, about uh, the increase in suicide rates and didn't want to leave it there. Didn't want to have that be uh, the end of the conversation. Any further thoughts or, or thinking along the lines of maybe the tie into social emotional learning and, and how you know, these changes we're seeing on instructing the whole student uh, and getting into this idea of uh, how we interact with one another uh, is really becoming more and more important as generations move into the classroom and begin learning. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, first off, thanks for giving us uh, the opportunity to, get, to not leave on uh, too abrupt a note there. Uh, and uh, too bad we couldn't get Brandon in for the last piece here. But um, but yeah, I think it does tie very much to social emotional learning and uh, meeting the learner where she is. Um, just understanding that um, really regardless of your generation, I think the impact of social media and uh, new media uh, and the level to which it's sort of infusing and uh, really inundating us throughout our lives, I think is increasingly impacting our psychological development and making us feel uh, um, maybe a little more vulnerable. And uh, when teaching uh, or when developing curriculum or instructional design for, uh, for any audience, I think trying to understand better how, uh, how they might feel and how they might be uh, more uh, self-conscious and more, um, more uh, competitive and uh, maybe a little more uh, vulnerable when it comes to their, uh, their personal identity. Uh, and in some ways, I think the, you know, we talked a little bit about the mindfulness movement. I think a combination of the mindfulness movement and social emotional uh, learning are very much uh, in response to some of those vulnerabilities that are being exposed these days. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a lot to talk about around um, burnout and the impact of new media on our identities. Uh, and then uh, how that should inform how we design our curriculum. So like, it's not purely the the cognitive side we're not just teaching the concepts we're also trying to understand what might get in the learner's way and how much of that might actually be tied to uh some of the themes we've talked about around burnout um i think it's a great topic for another show actually to talk about um it's, it's a it's a tough topic but i think it's an important one just to talk about uh really the the the, the rise of suicide rates and, uh, and some of the challenges that folks, it's actually becoming a, a, like really a national health emergency in some ways. So uh, it might be an interesting topic to pick up with, uh, with, a, with a medical professional uh, or you know, somebody with, with, a, with a deeper understanding of, uh, of the psychology and some of those trends that we're seeing. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's just a reminder that um, you know, we do want to teach the whole human and sometimes the whole human uh, may be facing challenges that uh, those of us maybe in the older generations are not feeling quite the same way, uh, which brings us back to the importance of empathy and um, trying, to, trying to understand what it's like to be someone uh, maybe a little bit different from yourself. Social emotional learning, mindfulness, both topics that we'll dive into more in the future. And to Mike's point, uh, bring on a guest uh, to talk about suicide rates, hospitalization rates are up. Uh, there, there, there are trends there that obviously need addressing both in the classroom, at home, as uh, you know, societally, as we move forward. 
Uh, I do want to share before we go something I think that will help inform those discussions in, in the future. Another article, more of a column. It was an opinion piece on, on Vox uh, from a pastor, I believe from North Carolina, who talked that it's not social media that's the problem. It's the pressure. The pressure of, and this is to Mike's point, new media, technology, the push notifications. Grades are coming directly to students' phones. Uh, they're checking them every night. Uh, application admissions to colleges are coming straight. SAT results. It's all there and it's all real time. And how do we deal with that as well in this conversation? I'll share that on social media um, to uh, add to this conversation. And I think we'll add to the conversation as we dive into it again in the future. Mike, any, any final thoughts here overall on millennial burnout, on generational learning? We've talked about it a few different times. I think we've come to similar conclusions each time, uh, but any further thoughts before we close it out? Yeah, I guess two closing thoughts. One, uh, which, I, which I've, I've kind of hit this beat a few different times, but I, I kind of want to reinforce it. Uh, you know, the, I've talked a few times about uh, Todd Rose's work at uh, uh, the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Ed uh, in, and he wrote a great book called The End of Average, which, um, which really uh, paints a pretty clear picture of humans as being multidimensional and changing over time. And uh, really uh, almost a cautionary uh, tale of the risks around uh, overgeneralizing uh, and uh, stereotyping and um, thinking about these problems as uh, uniformly had in the same way by everybody who's born within a relatively wide uh, generational window, I think that, it, that, that is risky. Uh, I think there are some real trends that are happening that we need to keep an eye on, but I think each individual is engaging with uh, some of the complexities that the new world uh, that we live in uh, are presenting. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, aspect to it where I think there's some real value to generational thinking, but I think there's a lot of risks. Uh, so so that, that's the first thought. Uh, and then I think the second thought is more on your last point about uh, interruptions and um, uh, you know, real time, everything right at the fingertips, uh, you know, feeling, uh, feeling very uh, exposed and competitive all the time. Um, I think that's if you don't actually take control of how you're consuming the media. So I do think there's a real benefit to um, uh, the, the concept of intentionality, which we've talked about, where, um, you know, I think we've talked on, on a personal level, like, you know, I've uh, deleted my Facebook account, I've turned off all of my notifications, uh, I wind up checking social media myself way more than I, I'd like to admit, but it's not so much of an inbound interruption, it's more like I have to intentionally go there. And when I'm there, I can, you know, experience it. And then when I leave it, it can go away, which I think ties back to the, um, the, the whole notion of mindfulness uh, and intentionality. So, so I'd say, you know, on the one hand, be careful about generalizing, uh, you know, seek out diversity and understand that regardless of when you're born, you might have something in common with somebody with a different background. Uh, and then also we should be listening to each other and empathizing with each other. And then on the other hand, I, th I think, um, experiment with taking control over how you consume some of these new media. I think it's risky to fully shut them off. I think to, to be a, a citizen in the 21st century, you need to engage with some of these new media forms that are emerging just to stay current and relevant. But I'd say, you know, always remember that you have some agency over it. Uh, and I think there's a lot uh, to explore there around how folks are being taught or can be taught uh, to be smarter about um, really their own mental health as it relates to social media, which um, might be a good topic for, for another show down the road. That, that's exactly where I was going to go. The idea of should we be better educating teenagers, young kids, adults about mm -hmm. how to use social media, how it affects your, your psyche, your mental health, all those things. A, a great point and something uh, to talk about on a future episode. Uh, great stuff from Mike, great stuff from Brandon as well. Uh, we'll be back uh, next Tuesday with a new episode as we often are. We're also working on uh, uh, continuing this conversation around millennial burnout. Uh, we will share that out uh, when available to you. And of course, you can always find us over on uh, Twitter at Trending and Ed, same on Facebook, trendingandeducation.com. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, tune in, share us with a friend, share us with a colleague. We want you to be part of the conversation each and every week right here on Trending in Education. Thank you.